Hello and welcome to Mystery Made Known, a video channel about all things Jesus and the Gospel. In this video, we are considering discipleship of Jesus and its relationship to the Word, that is, to the Bible. I wonder what your earliest memories are of receiving any kind of instruction. For me, it was my dad teaching me how to catch a butterfly or a moth in a butterfly net without harming them in any way. Other early memories include the detailed instructions for putting together and making plastic model aircraft and ships. I can also remember pretty strict instructions at school in the chemistry lab when using the Bunsen burner and the chemicals and even stricter instructions when I was an Air Training Corps cadet and I was using rifles on the rifle range. But the most thrilling instructions I remember was in a basic Royal Air Force trainer as an Air Cadet when I was given control to fly it. But eclipsing all that, probably the most intense instructions in manuals I've ever dealt with were the training and operating instructions um, as a military air crew, especially the flight reference cards for flight procedures. I mean, they had to be pretty intense because the stakes are so high and making sure that everything runs smoothly in the airborne environment. When you stop to think about it, our modern lives are just full of instruction. I wonder how many appliance and equipment manuals we have stuffed away somewhere in our homes, certainly more than we did 50 years ago. I mean, just think about it. In your average home, manuals and instructions for using vacuum cleaners, cookers, washing machines, dishwashers, putting together flat pack furniture, instruction for microwaves, lawn mowers, strimmers, power washers, televisions, cameras, audio systems, you get the idea. And that's not to mention smartphones and personal computers and all the instructions for the various apps that they use. Yeah, our lives, we use lots of pretty complicated stuff. And that's just in the home, not to mention any instructions and manual required for us to be able to do our stuff at work. So the Bible then, is it an instruction manual for discipleship of Jesus? Well, many see it that way. And in a way, yes, it is. I mean, the Bible is a massive collection of literature that clearly contains instructions revealing God's will for human life and behaviour. It also contains loads of stories that serve as instruction for life under God's blessing as well. The most obvious part is the presence in the Bible of the law of Moses, and it pretty much goes throughout the whole of the Bible and makes sense of what Jesus was doing and his death and resurrection. I mean, the law of Moses, it contains over 600 explicit commands to instruct the nation of Israel on how to live and worship God. So, is the Bible si simply an instruction manual on how to pursue a godly life through following its instructions? Well, the answer to that is no way. That idea and approach mis misunderstands the profound nature of the Bible and scripture as the living word of God. The instruction manual approach leads to dead religion. By contrast, the written word that contains the gospel message cleanses a person, instructs a person for salvation and gives new birth. It's a vehicle to eternal life. The Bible no, is no mere manual. We're told it's sharper than any double-edged sword which penetrates so much as to divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow, the word that judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Ah, the Bible is far more than simply a book of instructions for one important reason, because of the identity of the author. What takes the Bible to a whole different level as human written language is the identity of its ultimate author, 
God himself. Scripture is God-breathed, we're told, and it doesn't find its source in human wisdom and intellect. This is mind-blowing, so deep and profound, but the clearest indication of this, the other level nature of this scripture, is its connection with Jesus. The best place to go to check this out is John's Gospel. And the gospel opens with the astonishing revelation that Jesus is fully God, become human. But interestingly, he is referred to as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when we speak of the Word of God, first and foremost, we don't think of God's spoken Word or even written Word, but Jesus himself, the living Word of God. Let me explain. God the Son is the ultimate, perfect and complete communication of God to humanity. God's final word is actually God himself in human form, Jesus, revealing everything a human could possibly need to know or know at all about God through the human words and deeds of Jesus and the witnesses, the witness of his apostles that followed. Jesus clearly reveals that the words he speaks are the very words of God himself, that they are spirit and that they are life. You see, the Bible isn't an instruction manual because of its relationship with a divine author. Just as Jesus took on human flesh and brought it under perfect holy obedience to the Father, so too the words he spoke brought human language and communication under obedience, so as to communicate the ultimate and complete pure truth about reality about who we are, about who God is. I mean, just think about it. All our manuals, all the ones I mentioned before, all those instruction documents, even the flight reference cards, have no active relationship with those who authored them. They can simply be used and effectively followed without any direct association with the authors at all. Not so the Bible. The Word of God is intended to be the means of encountering the author, God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit opening up our minds and hearts to the truth of the Word and entering into the deepest level of communion and fellowship with Him. Clearly, discipleship of Jesus involves his word, that is, his teaching and instruction. I mean, Jesus himself says, If you hold to my teaching, you are my authentic disciples. In doing this, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So, discipleship of Jesus is discipleship of Jesus, the living word, which includes his spoken word. So it's not surprising to find Jesus also speaks of the word being internalized. That's that communion thing with the author again. For example, he criticizes the religious leaders for an entirely external relationship with the scriptures. He says, even though the Old Testament reveals who Jesus is, they can't see it and they won't believe it. He uses this phrase to describe their relationship with the scriptures. He says, because the word doesn't dwell in them. In this idea of the scriptures dwelling in a person, we find the fulfillment of an important difference between the Old and New Testament. That is the Old and New Covenant. The Old Covenant is discipleship of the law of God, characterized by external human empowered effort in trying to obey it. By contrast, the new covenant is discipleship of Jesus, characterized by internal Holy Spirit empowerment to pursue the character of Jesus and his law of love. The first relates to the old humanity in Adam, the second to the new humanity in Jesus. In fact, the beginning of John's gospel reveals the distinction between the two when it says this, The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul makes a similar distinction when he writes, God has made us competent 
as ministers of a new covenant, that is the new covenant in Jesus, not of the letter of the law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Here we see the distinction of approaching the Bible as seen as a list of rules that leads to dead religion or a means by which the Holy Spirit brings life-giving communion with the living God. It is in Jeremiah 31 that God makes the big announcement about this new covenant to come. Its single characteristic difference from the Old Covenant, from the Old Testament, is that with the New Covenant in Jesus, God will internalise his word inside of people. No longer will it be essentially an external thing to learn and obey, but an internal thing to guide and empower. And that internal power is nothing less than the Holy Spirit of God. So we can say there are two ways to engage with the Bible. The first is like the religious leaders of Jesus's time, to engage with scripture through human effort, knowledge and intellect, all in an attempt to establish God's instructions, work them out and then apply them through human power to life. That's the rules and regulations approach, the do's and don'ts approach. The second is to engage with the scriptures through the indwelling Holy Spirit in order to lead a person to an encounter with God and so have the character of Jesus formed within them. The result of the first is reading the Bible to know about God. The second is reading the Bible to encounter him and know him. Jesus is inseparable from the word of God. That's why the end of the command that he gives to his disciples to go and make disciples, including passing on all of his teaching, it includes a declaration that he will be with them constantly to the very end of the age, his presence. So then there are these two ways to approach, to engage with the Bible, either as an external text, a religious text read and perceived through human power, or approached and engaged with as the internal voice of Jesus himself. The Bible, or more accurately, the truths it contains, are vital to authentic discipleship of Jesus. I mean, the, di the disciple engages with the Bible in order to encounter the living voice of God, especially the New Testament, the final and full revelation of God in Jesus. It's not to gain information about God, no, but to grow in faith and fellowship with God. So the real deal is that in no way is the Bible just a manual or instructions for a godly life. It's the living word of God, the word that renews the mind and brings total transformation to a person so that we get to know God's good, perfect and pleasing will. And the evidence is the fruit of the loving character and nature of Jesus being formed within a person that approaches the Bible in that way. A word that, as the Bible describes, sets the human heart on fire when heard through faith. So, when you pick up a Bible, think about how you're approaching it. Think about how you understand what's about to happen. Consider your aspirations and expectations as you start to read the text. Ask how open or closed you are in your mind, whether you have any prejudices or preconceived ideas. You see, the Bible should be approached with humility and openness. Does it feel overwhelming? Well, the answer to that is yes for many. And don't worry about that, because for the last 2,000 years, most of the disciples of Jesus never had their own copy, and they probably couldn't even read it if they did. And yet whatever was needed to faithfully follow Jesus, they accomplished through his power within them. So what you and I are looking for when we read the Bible are words that touch us at the deepest level, our soul level, relate to our lives and how our lives are lived. Remember this, it isn't about acquisition of knowledge, it's about establishing and building a relationship. The Bible says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. 
Trust God, the Holy Spirit, to open your mind to understand what you're unable to comprehend just through human wisdom. Expect God to do the revealing rather than you to do the discovering. Expect God to give understanding of what counts in your life rather than you working it all out through wisdom and intellect. So, I pray that if you don't already, you will come to cherish the Bible and hear the loving voice of Jesus through it. I pray that you will grow and grow in your understanding and appreciation of the work that it does within you. And I pray that as you do all this, you will indeed be an authentic disciple of Jesus himself, a disciple of the living word.